Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History It's March 22nd, and on this day in 1969, a tragic accident cut short an amazing runner's career. Abebe Bikila is probably not a name you've heard too often or at all, but what he accomplished in his short running career and then what that inspired has had a dramatic effect on distance running for decades and is still evident today. Before we get to what happened on this day, I want to talk about his amazing accomplishments first. Bakila grew up in Ethiopia and had been a shepherd before becoming a bodyguard to Ethiopia's emperor, Haile Selassie. It wasn't until he was 24 that he became interested in running when he saw a marathon on television. And he quickly realized that he had a talent for running long distances, and he soon caught the eye of the coach of Ethiopia's distance running team. After joining the team, Bakila trained hard, but in the lead up to the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome, he was left off the marathon team and was only added as a replacement when another runner broke his foot. The only problem now is he didn't have any shoes. His were worn out. He was given a new pair, but in warm-up runs, they rubbed blisters. So he made the decision to run without shoes for the Olympic marathon. Running a course that included the cobbled Appian Way, Bakila split from the pack with one other runner, and then he powered away from him with 500 meters to go in the race to win in a record time of 2 hours, 15 minutes, 16.2 seconds, shattering the Olympic marathon record by nearly 8 minutes and the world record by 8 tenths of a second. It was also the first time an East African had won an Olympic gold medal. After the race, Bakila spoke about his decision to run barefoot this way. I wanted the world to know that my country, Ethiopia, always won with determination and heroism. Four years later in Tokyo, Bakila won the marathon again, this time wearing shoes, to become the first person to repeat as an Olympic marathon champion. His win in Rome made him a national hero, and repeating only made his stature grow more. It was the inspiration behind the distance running boom in Ethiopia and Kenya, and of course that influence continues to this day. Just take a look at the top 10 men's and women's marathon times and you will see that 18 of the 20 names on those two lists are either from Ethiopia or Kenya. And you can draw a line back to what Abebe Bikila did at the Olympics and other races in the 60s. So now, what happened on this day in 1969? Well, Bakila was driving in Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa, and he swerved to avoid a car coming from the opposite direction. He lost control of his Volkswagen Beetle, and he rolled down an embankment. He was not discovered and rescued from his car until the following morning. The accident initially left him a quadriplegic, but over time, and through rehabilitation, he was able to regain the use of his arms. Bakila was invited to the 1972 Munich Games as an ambassador, and American Frank Shorter made a point of shaking his hand after he won the gold in the marathon that year. Sadly, in October 1973, Bakila died of a cerebral hemorrhage that had been a result of the car accident that he suffered on this day in 1969. Also on this day, with the recent excitement surrounding Iowa's Caitlin Clark and setting the all-time NCAA scoring record, passing Pete Maravich, we can run a through line to the first women's collegiate game on this day in 1893. The game took place at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. It was not a game between two different colleges, but rather between a team of sophomores and a team of freshmen. The women played two 15-minute halves, and the sophomores won 5-4, with each made basket counting as one point. But if you remember back to the December 21st edition of This Dish, 
The game was rough then, with several players injured, and so it was in this first version of the women's game. One of the freshman women dislocated her shoulder, and her team had to play down a player the rest of the way. Now, men were not allowed in to watch this game at the all-women's college, but there was a throng of women watching from the running track above the court. The game was put together by Cinda Berenson, not quite two years after James Naismith introduced the game to students in Springfield, about 20 miles from Northampton. Berenson used a modified version of Naismith's rules for this game and is fairly unique in that the men's and women's versions of the sport grew mostly in parallel to each other. This game led to a contagion-like growth of the game at women's colleges, with the first intercollegiate game played just three years later between Cal and Stanford. And I'll have more about that game in the April 4th edition of This Dish. And in 1934, the first Masters got underway. The tournament was the idea of the most famous golfer in the world at the time, Bobby Jones. Jones, an Atlanta native, built Augusta National along with golf course architect Alistair McKenzie. Jones' plan for Augusta National was to build the perfect golf course to play with friends away from the constant demand from fans for his attention. Horton Smith, Jimmy Hines, and Emmett French each shot 70 on this day to share the first round lead at two under par. Smith continued his steady play throughout the remaining three rounds to beat Craig Wood by a shot. Only four golfers were able to shoot under par for the tournament on McKenzie's undulating greens. Smith would win the Masters again in 1936. But what about Jones? Well, he got off to a rough start on this day, shooting 76 with 36 of those strokes coming as putts. He finished six over for the tournament, 10 shots behind the winner. And today's non-sports fun fact. Canadian radio stations are required to play at least 35% of their content from Canadian artists. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports historynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.